Could you please pronounce your name correctly for me? Rosa Sigrún Jónsdóttir. Just call me Rosa. Right. Well, I was going to ask, like, do you go by the whole name? Because I know in Iceland there's the whole Jónsdóttir is sort of not your last name as much as it's just your parental affiliation. Yes. Yes, it is. And then I have, you know, I have two first names named after my grandmother and my grandmother's sister, Rosa Sigrún. But I normally I just go by Rosa. Okay, fair enough. Now, so you're in Iceland, and give me a little lowdown on like your history of like what what your artistic career has sort of spanned. It started late. In that sense, I started studying late. But I guess I'm brought up on a farm in northern part of Iceland, and there I guess. Uh, the emphasis was much more on like literature and theater and things like that. And to tell the truth, I wanted to become an actress in a way, but I was too scared to apply for the school. And while I was around 20 or something, I thought, you know, actresses had to be so beautiful and all that, you know. So that way the years went by and, you know, but still I had always been doing things with my hands since early childhood, you know, always creating something out of clay, drawing, destroying furniture, you know, in my parents' homes and things like drawing on the walls and all that. So when I was 35, I was teaching actually elementary school and I took formal teacher's education and partly through crafts there. Yeah, part of so. So I was, you know, able to teach crafts at school. But I was unhappy. I really couldn't, you know, really enjoy teaching for some reason. So I just sort of, when I was, yeah, shortly after 30, I started joining some art courses, drawing, model drawing and all that. And eventually when I was, I think, 34, I decided to apply for the University of the Arts home in Iceland. And I got in. And so therefore, that way it sort of started. But in a way, I think in the hindsight, it's in a way it's a good thing. And it's also this advantage. In a way, I think sort of my ideas and all that were in a way too formed about what I wanted to do. And yeah, also, of course, other students, they were much younger than I was. So it also affected how I made friends. And I had already, you know, had my husband and we had sort of a family. And so I was in a different place in life. Well, that can be an advantage and or a disadvantage, depending. I went to school with a bunch of like, when I was 18 to 21 kind of thing, and there were some older um, students. And uh, quite honestly, I mean, even if they didn't really connect with people so much, they really made beautiful work because their ideas were a bit more mature, I would say, I guess. Yeah, in a way. And also both a good thing and a bad thing, you know, maybe more, you're more sure about what you're interested in when you are older, which is a good thing. Then you can sort of focus more on that. But it also, you are maybe somewhat less likely to experiment in a way and try things that actually might take you somewhere in a different position and then to an interesting place. So, yeah, but here I am, <laughs> at least. Oh, yeah. I've run into the same thing. Like, I moved from continents. I went from the United States to the Middle East, now to Europe. And and every time people are like, well, why don't you just do this new thing instead? Because you're in a new place. You're being newly inspired. And I'm like, and, and I'm sort of, maybe I'm stuck in a rut of like, I want to do what's familiar or maybe I'm just not willing to try something new, but it happens over time. The sort of the old, you know, the older we all get, the more sort of narrow our field of vision and interest gets. And I think also it just takes time to become mature in as an artist. You just have to go through this 
phase and time of the doing, redoing, looking at works, thinking about them, leaving them behind, taking them out again, and all that. And that just takes years. I mean, I'm now 20 years since my graduation, and in a way, I think it is mostly now recently that I feel that I can, in a way, of course I make mistakes, and I hope I will not stop making mistakes. But more easily, I think I can look at the thing I'm doing. Yes, I think there is something there. I think I'm on the right track here. I think I make somewhat less mistakes maybe now than I did. But also, in a way, I'm more on the safe path, maybe, which is, for us an artist, maybe not so good thing. So you never know what you're doing, actually. <laughs> it, it's hard because you, you never know what's going to be. It sounds really bad when I say it like this, but like you never know what's going to be ac accepted you know, by the, the whoever's, the the buyers, the exhibitors, the whatever. You, you, so you just work and whether it's writing proposals or actually making work, like you just sort of make what you think they will like and you hope it and then maybe they don't and you don't. And the, the thing that bothers me about this, it's that aspect of the arts industry is like, so like you could be sitting in your studio making a bunch of stuff that that's you think is fabulous but nobody else thinks it's fabulous, but nobody, nobody else could tell you why. Exactly. They'll just say, no, we don't want to exhibit it. But like, but why, what, what are we doing wrong? What, what could you do better? They, they can't give you that. So it's really difficult industry because they can say no, but they can't tell you why no. There always has to be the right bus somehow around the person who is doing it. It has so much to do with your character and all that, you know, yeah. It's a very complicated in a relationship between artists and the art world as a market. It's a complicated connection. Indeed. But, but let's get to your work itself. So when I looked at your work, so I'm just going to give you sort of my sophomore approach to what I see but like your work as a general whole the thing I notice about it is is it's it, there's a lot of small intricacies that you then build into larger things so like everything I saw from 20 years ago to now it's always about very small things being built up into something else some bigger web or of something yeah why that's a good question I've tried to think about it and try to understand why I do this. One reason, I guess, it is that I'm, in a way, I'm obsessed with just work itself, using my hands, creating things, small things, something that become something different. And in a way, it started sort of with, household things, maybe, you know, Q-tips to clean your ears, or, or I was thinking about changing or trying to see something new out of ordinary daily things that we have around us in our household. I saw some with the matchsticks, I think, as well. Yes, the matchsticks. And collecting plants, it's also because... I do this guiding and I'm always out in nature. And I guess a part of how we work, me and my husband, is that, you know, he is into the bigger picture, the history, all the stories and like that. Whereas I go into nature, geology, plants, weather, all that. I'm constantly, you know, looking down in front of my feet, what I see there. All the small plants, all the all the small rocks, the pebbles, all that. And I think that is somehow just, you know, rooted in my head. And so I collect maybe withered flower parts and I do something, you know, mix them with textiles somehow, I don't know, maybe trying to make them eternal somehow. Or just Simply turning them into, yeah, giving them a new life again. 
Well, I'm interested in this tour guiding thing because one of the things that always interests me is basically like, how do artists make a living? Because like very few in the world literally make their hundred percent of their income from sales or exhibition of their art, and they always we all do something else. And so you do tour guides, you or you are a tour guide through Iceland, and the, the, like are these like day trips are these like hike like mountainous hiking 10 day trips like what do you do mountain hiking you know i'm licensed as a glacier guide we take people actually i broke my collarbone on a bicycle this spring so i missed the tours to all the highest peaks this spring but my husband did them you know yeah and we have been doing that more or less every spring for quite many years now, as we are, you know, I think I'm turning 59 now this year. So we have more or less, we have stopped carrying, you know, everything on a, a really backpacking. But tomorrow we start a four day tour to a really remote area in Iceland, in the northwest part of Iceland. No one lives there. We have to bring with us, you know, a satellite phone to be able to connect if something comes up. But there is an old lighthouse at the almost the northernmost tip of Iceland. It was built 1930. And we will be staying there for three nights with a group of 22. So there will be 24 of us doing day hikes from the lighthouse. But we have to carry our luggage, our sleeping bags to the lighthouse and back again. And it's just an amazing place to stay. And boats run there during summer. And this lighthouse is now run by the Touring Association of Iceland. And there is a warden there. And he just goes out to sea to catch, you know, fish. And all the freezers are full stored with food. So we can just, you know, live a luxury life. There is electricity there because what's it called? It's a, there is a generator run by the river. A hydroelectric generator. Yeah, 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 exactly. Wow, okay. So it's a luxury place, far from it all. But the disadvantage is it was on the news that there might actually be a polar bear in the area. But <laughs> Okay, let's hope not. Let's hope not, no. Yeah. Let's hope it is, but at a far enough distance that everybody can just enjoy looking. Yeah, this is the way we will be spending, you know, most of the summer. Well, and that, so that's, it sounds like, so you work this like seasonal job and then what, so then you're basically like you do your art practice sort of off season. Sort of. Yes. We take some hikes, you know, during winter, but maybe just one a week or so. So from approximately September until spring, we are mostly home and I get a good time at my studio and there is like exhibitions, I think too. I'm preparing for next year. And so it is actually, it works out beautifully for me. Well, that's one of the things is like some people, some creative people like love creative jobs and then they come home and do their creative thing also kind of thing. But some people like sort of, to get away from their creativity, let's say, and then sort of come back to it, sort of refreshed. So everybody sort of approaches it differently. I think I'm more on that side uh, because I have done some teaching, like teaching at art school in Reykjavik and, and things like that. But normally I just come home, you know, empty as a blotter. So, yeah, most of my artistic energy goes in there. Whereas for other people, I envy them. It seems to and highlight their energy and boost it. Indeed. I wish I was that way. Yeah, I get sucked of energy when I teach. Even when I do this podcast, like it takes me a couple hours to, afterwards to sort of recuperate and sort of recharge to get back in there. But yeah, it's everybody's different. Everybody's different. That's a wonderful thing about it. Yeah, yeah. Now, in your work itself, I notice you do a lot of crocheting. Is that is that what you're doing now, or is that what you did do? It is. It sort of started in art school. But I have always, though, it depends on the idea. Sometimes doing some videos, if it feels like fitting the idea or giving it 
or if the exhibition is sort of more like installation or, or space related presentation, quite often some sort of video, relatively simple always though, can be part of it. But I guess for me, the textiles, I find interesting to try to use this traditional method in a new way and bring life to it. And I also, I think it has healing powers in a way, just doing it, working with your hands. Therefore, in some of my works, I have also like integrated people who work with me on a project. And in a way, I'm not looking for working hands, you know, to help me finish the job. But I like them to be sort of part of it. So it just becomes this mutual effort. And sometimes they add something to it that I would not have been able to provide if I was alone. Something unexpected comes out of it. So you... So you're saying if you do large scale, let's say installation pieces, that you'll have other people sort of knit with you, sort of under your guidance. Yeah, it has happened, like with both, yeah, big textile installations and like big flower pattern installations of the medical Icelandic medicinal plants I have been using, working on. Yeah, group of craftswomen, and like with the flowers, it has more been like symbolic maybe a woman choosing a flower a favorite flower and she finds a way sometimes actually i create the pattern if people prefer or they figure out themselves how to create the form of the plant so yeah for me it is like this mutual effort and the power of unity it's yeah I find it interesting. Well, when I looked at, okay, because I saw your exhibition in Florence, the large scale crochet installation. And the thing I started thinking about, I'm like, okay, did you make this work in it? Like, did you make it and then say, hmm, where can I exhibit it? Or did you like write a proposal, get an agreed exhibition, and then start producing this work? Yes, it was the latter. There was a space relatively big space in the Art Museum of Akureyri, which was so that it was on two levels and you could stand on the second floor and look down into the exhibition space. And I wanted, just visualized this installation there, this thing where I could walk the ground floor and look up and see, look at it one way, and then I could go to the second floor and look down on it. And also, this installation you saw, I was working on hard ice outlet glaciers at that time. And one of the most dangerous things you can find on glaciers are moules. They're water holes that go straight into the ice formed by water, meltwater. And this is a thing you don't want to fall into. And <laughs> But they can be absolutely beautiful and mesmerizing, so blue down. And I always was wondering what they would look like from the inside. So you could actually, they are, the works I created, they are like cylinders. So they are, in a way, how I visualized the inside, how the, if you made like a three-dimensional moulin, it would look something like that. But it was a big installation, and then I got a group of craftswomen working with me. So I just made the patterns, or sort of out of paper, and the biggest ones, I divided them into three parts, and one woman did each part, one part. So one woman did one part. So actually, maybe three or four women worked on the same one in different sections. And then I got the, I choose also, I handed out the yarn and the colors. After that, they were just free to create the way, whether they use crochet or knitting or what, 
patterns and how they arrange the colors. Then I got all the pieces and fitted it together. That was an example where actually the power of the many made more of it than I ever could have alone. Yes, quite probably. Because I don't think I would have come up with all those different patterns and strange color combinations and all that. that <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but yeah. Well, but I mean, okay, what's the thing that fascinates me? I love these like large scale installation, sort of experiential sort of exhibitions and stuff. As an American, I look at it, I'm like, how did you f pay for that? Because <laughs> like it's got to have been expensive, it just the, the the material itself. And then, of course, the the man hours. I mean, just the, the time put into it. it. There's no way that they paid enough <laughs> or whoever paid it paid enough. No. I mean, like this installation, textile installation, I haven't sold it yet. But it is actually yarn in Iceland. And I mostly used, like, I used a lot of wool, and it is actually inexpensive. It is not expensive. The most of the money, if you like, it's the man hours that I put into it. And they are there, yeah. And like the flower bed works. This crochet yarn, it is not expensive, but it's mostly really, really time consuming because I have to do sketches with watercolors out in nature while hiking, what the plants look like. And then I have to figure out how to get the form with using crochet. And I love crochet because it is for me just like clay. I can form more or less whatever I use using this technique. And it's strong and durable and yeah. Then I use glue to stiffen them. And then I paint them with acrylics. So they are actually like three-dimensional paintings. So it's a lot of time to make. And even though someone helps me doing some of the crochet, it is a lot of work. I know, but I mean, like, I'm trying to figure out how do, how do, I mean, because like you probably end up losing money on it until it sells theoretically. But like, well, so I guess it leads to the question of like, are you doing sales? Like, so are you making sales? I mean, how's the industry treating you? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm doing some sales. I mean, I'm a low income in general, you know, in Iceland. But I prefer sort of, I get by and I prefer that. I guess my income is more or less 50-50 through guiding and art. That's pretty good. And most, I do also, because I do this, what I do sell also is, and that's more or less just private, like drawings, flower drawings and watercolors and things like that. It's just to sort of, yeah. Okay. Get food on the table. But that leads, okay. So what you're saying is you sell like smaller sort of, uh, you know, smaller works, but you have these big works. So where do you store these big works? Because storage is one of those things that like, my, my wife is an accountant and I'm an artist. And so she's always like, why do we need so much storage for all these artworks that aren't being on an exhibition and they're not selling? And I'm like, because it's my artwork and it needs to be stored. The thing is actually with like the textile, the soft textiles pack really easily. And when the thing is like the big installation you saw in Florence, I just bring them with me, you know, in two suitcases. Yeah, but I mean, what about the like the flowers? Those are incredibly delicate. I can't imagine I'm, they've got to be stored some proper way. Yeah, but normally I just you know yeah I, well I do store them, but luckily I don't store that much at any given time. I have sold some of them, and and also like the flower beds, I only started making them something like two thousand. 16, 17 or something. So they are relatively new. And so I haven't got, you know, I haven't got a big pile store yet. But when I'm storing them, I can sort of put them all really tight together. So they take much less space than they do when they are exhibited. So I can sort of pack them quite densely. But yeah, of course, they take space. 
I, I do works on paper and, and in the grand scheme of art that they're pretty small and easy to store, but they still take up space and weigh a lot when you move. I don't recommend moving with your entire art collection. It's not fun. No. Well, so, but now how do you do your sales these days? Or do you have a gallery representing you? What are you, or are you doing it yourself? Social media? No, no, no. I don't have a gallery representing me. No. Do you want a gallery representing you? In a way, a year, I mean, it's yes and no, you know. <laughs> it is, it, it is, I think my ego would like to have a gallery, yeah. We all want to be able to say, yes, I'm represented by so-and-so. And if, oh, you'd like to buy my work? Please call my representative. Yeah, we all want to do that. But I've been doing okay, you know, without it. In that sense. So, yeah, the answer is yes and no. Okay. I would like to, in a way, yeah. Maybe it will happen before I turn. Yeah. I don't know what. We all hope it'll happen. But, I mean, like, it, it, it's really interesting. Like, there was a time when I, probably when I was young, when I remember, like, the only way to be successful was to have a gallery. And these days, there are so many other outlets and avenues and ways to do it. I mean, you could just be a, an amazing grant writer or an amazing residency applier, and you could make a pretty good living doing all that stuff. So, like, you don't you don't really have to be selling work. You could just you can fund your work in other ways. And that is also sort of the good thing about the guiding. I don't have to rely too much on selling. I prefer also just to be able to experiment and do works that are hard to sell. Sort of, yeah, just have my artistic freedom in that sense. Yeah, I know. But it's, it, it's, it, that's one of those struggles that I like, I fight with like internally all the time. It's like, I want to make whatever the fuck I want to make without any influence. But, we all want some amount of acclaim or respect or whatever we, we recognition. We, we want that, you know, cause like I have this old thing that somebody used to say, like, Oh, I only make my work for myself. And I'm like, that's bullshit because if you only made it for yourself, you would never show it to me. So like as soon as an artist shows their work to any other person, they want accolades acclaim recognition whatever so like we all want that it's really hard though but can be like maybe meant by it was that i don't want to be have to rely too much on making art you know that fits nicely on the walls in the homes of people you know sort of to make a living oh i understand that yeah yeah so Rather than, I mean, I guess I could be doing more of my watercolors and my pencil drawings, and but I think in a way, it would also kill me. It would it would take the joy out of it, and you know, if I had to do it for sort of yeah. So therefore, just going and visit this lighthouse, it can just be a good thing, you know. Well, it's that sense of expectations. That that's a word that sort of haunts me in my life. Like the the expectations that people get on you. Like once you're a quote unquote like selling artist, then you're expected to continue to sell. You're expected to make the same kind of works, kind of thing. And it's it's uh, discouraging. It's it's sort of the antithesis of the creative creativity that we all desire, the freedom. Anyways. Now, I noticed that you do you did a number of residencies. Mm -hmm. I love residencies. Yeah, I did for a while, but now actually I'm planning on, you know, starting again, <laughs> applying for residencies. After COVID, everybody's applying for residencies. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. That's probably true. Well, but I mean, but what were your experiences with them? I mean, I saw, I see here, I'm looking at your CV. You got India and Berlin and a couple others. What, you know, how did you, what were your experiences, I guess? Like, were they sort of individual uh, residencies? Were they group residencies? Like, how, what were some of the stories you have from those? 
in more or less, in all cases, there were, well, in some of the cases, I was just alone, you know, yeah. And like I was spent, I remember especially one month in a remote place in, in Sweden where I stayed for a month during dark winter and I was just on, on skis, you know, maybe for one hour a day and then for the, I hardly ever saw another living person. But it was a great time for working, actually. Yeah. I mean, time flew by because, yeah, I simply, I can very easily, you know, forget myself while working. And, and I just love working, I guess. Workaholic in a, in a way. Oh, yeah, we all are. But like, see, my, yes, we all are. Yeah. I mean, we love what we do. That's why we workaholics. But like, I've I've been running into the, the situation where I keep running out of resources. Like, so like, I work almost too fast. Uh, I almost I almost work too fast and too efficiently, and like, I run out of resources, and I can't get enough resources to keep up with the amount of work that I make. So that's my problem. Yeah. Yes, I have lots of half-finished works. But in some cases, like with the residencies, sometimes some of them ended with like group shows or group representations of what we had been doing, like we, when we were in India for something like six weeks. But it's always individual work. And that's also, though, maybe partly me that I tend to withdraw. I know, and I wonder whether that's beneficial or not. I mean, like, because I sometimes I talk to people through this podcast that like they're great showmans and they're they're great salespeople and all this, and and they have a certain level of success that in many ways I envy because I'm I don't think I'm a great showman or a great salesman, but I think I'm a pretty good artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's really hard because we're expected as artists these days to also be business people yes and that sucks yeah that sucks. <laughs> sucks so bad like i mean because you know like you i i know that you also got you've got a number of like awards and grants and residencies and stuff so like you seem to be pretty skilled at like writing proposals and applications and things like this yes i guess i'm I guess it maybe it comes, you know, from the writing upbringing, you know, and all what, you know. Yeah, the written word has always been highly respected in my family. So I guess it helps out. It helps out. Well, do you have any tips or tricks about like how to do any of those things? Because like I'm still new to it because it was it's not as common in America as it is in Europe. In Europe, it, I'm finding it's very uh primary to a lot of things like it, it, the it, a lot of artists are they're funded by things like the i know the icelandic salaries the, for artists the things like this and then there are proposals and then, of course there are residencies and all these kinds of things like these these just don't exist in america really i mean there are some but they're generally like super high echelon and you have to be a blue chip artist or be showing it gagosian to get it or something like that so well, I think maybe it's simply because I'm interested in this nature and all the plants and all that. It actually gives you this opportunity to visit places and people are interested if you are interested in their, if you're using and studying their culture or nature or, or whatever it is, it helps. <laughs> I know it totally sucks because, like, I, when I uh, this okay, this is my stupid arrogance of of my youth. I used to apply for for applications, and they'd be like, "Why do you want to come here?" And I'd be like, "Because I just need time away. <laughs> like, what? Like, I need time to devote to my work. Like that. That that's what I mean. But in reality, I mean, these days I could just get an Airbnb or whatever, like just get away." But it's it's very interesting. Like, I mean, I always say that the what artists want the most is time, money, and space. Like, if we can get those three things, then we're very happy. But of course, those are the three most difficult things for us to get. It is like me, and now I haven't just very little used, you know, graphic press. Isn't called that? It's 
print screen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, print screening, yeah. There is this print screening press. I don't even remember. It just fell into my mind. It is in Iceland. I was trying to find the residency again now the other days because I want to apply for it. Because according to the description, there is this living space on the ground floor and on the top floor, there is nothing there except this screen press. And I just want to be there and use it and work it there in some remote place in Finland. That's my dream now. <laughs> and, I, and that's what's hard is like these residencies, there, there are some amazing residencies in the world. I look for, I mean, I wish I could find the time and the energy and the wherewithal to like research the residencies and find the right ones and all this. But like, but they all like have these like, ideas of what they want from us that we want to just be able to go there and use their stuff and get away from our lives but they all seem to have like weird like little things like i keep running into like oh this one's about ecology or this one's about young artists or this one's only for women artists and and i'm just like Ugh. And this theme or 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 something yeah, yeah. and and i i don't fall into any of those things <laughs> Like, like, cause unfortunately, sadly for me, I guess at this point, it's like, I'm in the worst possible position because I am a white male heterosexual from America. Nobody wants to help us. <laughs> Everybody else can get all kinds of support. If you're a minority or you're a different gender, anything like this, they are all supported magnificently. And don't get me wrong. I am not like bitter or angry i'm just saying like i was born in the wrong era <laughs> yeah and i think you know i have to be you know now very careful because i think i might actually be simply getting too old so it is yeah elderly woman from iceland into knitting i don't know how <laughs> how interesting that might be you know it does I have to be very careful about how I choose the words when I write the application, I think. Yeah. I'm an old lady and I like knitting. Probably not going to go over well. Yes, no. yes. No, I'm not going, it's not going to fly. All right. Are there any, any topics that I sort of maybe couldn't research about you that you might want to sort of bring up that, like, surprise me with something? I wish I could. I'm maybe not in yeah, that's maybe my problem. I'm not, not good at surprising people. I didn't say there was a problem. I'm just sort of offering you the opportunity to like, because there's only so much I can do researching online. So like there are some parts of your life that I'm sure are not there. No, I think in a way, I think we have sort of covered it. Sort of what inspires me. It is, yeah, Simply the pure joy of working is and pure joy of experimenting. It's a huge drive for me. Well, actually, well, the, I forgot to ask. There's a question I generally ask everybody, which is sort of how did you get made? So like, what did your parents do? So like, how did, how did you sort of become creative kind of thing? Because you said you did a lot of breaking things and taking things apart as a kid, but like, what was the influence of like your siblings or your family or your te some teachers of age, anything like this? My parents were farmers. I lived on the farm until I was 20 and just went, of course, off to school. And it is just in the northern part of Iceland and, yeah, more or less far from everything. When you say farmers, is this plants, animals, all of it? Animals. Mixed farming, the most common type of farming in Iceland, we had something like 25, 30 milking cows and around 200 sheep, a sheep dog, cat to keep down the mice. And my mother's mother, she had hands so we could have eggs. That was our farm. Nice. And, you know, I just learned working for my parents. And I guess... In a way, my mother, and at that time, she, you know, she did all the knitting. And actually, I think my mother, she would be, you know, making clothes. She would be a designer today if she had the opportunity. And I guess I sort of, I take interest in knitting and crocheting and all that. I take that from her. And it is sort of, in a way, her heritage 
that this traditional heritage of women that I am sort of lifting, trying to lift up through my creative work. And But I guess I went to a boarding school. Bad kid, huh? Yeah, that's small. Uh, well, I tried to run away, actually, though, yeah. There you go. I knew there was I knew there was a bad kid in there somewhere. When you say boarding school, nobody goes to boarding school because they're straight A students. But it was a relatively new school with something like 90 kids there from 7 to 14 years old. And the buildings were new. And actually, the crafts section at the school was great. And there was a kiln there and there was, you know, sewing machines and drawing facilities and painting facilities and all sorts of groups because we were always there overnight. You could always in the evening to pass time, you could choose what activity, you know, you were interested in. So it was really highly respected and it was used at the school when I was growing up. So I think I was quite lucky. And also good teachers interested in crafts. And also like theater, it was, yeah, the theater group was what I was actually at that time very interested in. Aha. Uh-huh. All right. Now, uh, I, okay, well, I generally end up with two, there are two questions I ask people to sort of wrap things up. One is, is could you name three contemporary artists that you are looking at for whatever reason? Just people you admire, respect, enjoy their works. Oh, my God. That's a hard question. There is this, I don't know her personally. Her name is, I think she, she's Dutch. And I regularly look her up on the internet. Her name is Maria Bilinga, I think. She makes works, installations, wall relics, actually. Like, yeah. Out of tiny objects, like fish scales or whatever, and see, out of that, she creates, yeah, worlds I love. And, yeah, I love her. I'm studying, like, her technique and the color combinations and all that. Oh, I could see you're interested. Many of us, of course, name Ai Weiwei. And I guess I would name him because of his ways of using like traditional crafts like Chinese ceramics in a different way. You're literally the first person to ever say Ai Weiwei. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I somehow, I always, if I see his works somewhere in an exhibition hall somewhere in the world, it always somehow makes me, makes me stop for one reason or the other. Oh, yeah. He makes amazing works. There's no doubt about that. It's just fascinating. It, it, he's fascinating because he's continually making really strong work. Like, I don't think I've ever seen an Ai Weiwei where I was like, nah. <laughs> like, like, they're always strong. And always I, strong. Yeah. It's astounding how he can be, he can work so, he can work with so many diverse ways and yet do it really, really well. Shocking to me. But anyways, okay, third person. Let's just say, comes to my mind, Maria Abramowitz, because of her, mostly her performances. I'm not a performance artist. I think I've made performance one or twice, maybe as a part of an installation or something, because I felt it fitted in. But it is somehow her connection, how... Yeah, it's just mesmerizing her connection with the viewers and and the intensity of, yeah. I mean, it's a way I remember, for example, just to mention the work where where you could see invited visitors to sit on the other side of the table and just sat there looking in the eyes of each other. And I just seeing the videos of this, I just cry for some reason. I have no idea why. Just really strong emotion it evokes. In me. It was a very powerful piece. It was. Just two. Yeah. All right. Last little bit is some advice for the next generation. So something you learned through your career, positive, negative, that you, you know, can try and help the next generation do better than we did. You just have to follow your heart, even though it means making mistakes. Or 
That's it. <laughs> All right. That's it. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. It was great meeting you. I hope you are enjoying and learning from the stories, experiences, and advice of our guests as much as I am. If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and a nice comment would be greatly appreciated. Please be sure to tell your friends to listen and subscribe as well. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. Audio editing is done by Jakub Czerny. And for more information about the podcast and our guests, please visit our website, wisefoolpod.com. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners, Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene i Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website, wisefoolpod.com. Mm-hmm.